This training video is directed at the people responsible for installing and maintaining guardrails along our public roads. For your convenience, a pamphlet is included with this video as an added training tool. The Technology Transfer Program is part of the Federal Highway Administration's Rural Technical Assistance Program. Guardrail installation and repair is presented jointly by the Northwest T2 Center and the Alaska Technology Transfer Program. The following program is sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration, the Washington Department of Transportation, the Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities. Your host is Don J. Griffney, Design Standards and Policy Development Engineer with the Washington State DOT. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you on the subject of guardrail. Usually my presentation about guardrail are made to designers, but I believe strongly that everyone, that is everyone responsible for design, construction, and maintenance, should have a good understanding of it. Guardrail is itself a hazard and should be used only when it will shield an object that would cause a more severe accident if struck. Installed wrong, it could be a more dangerous object than the object it is intended to shield. Many years ago, it was felt important to keep the cars on the road no matter what happened to the vehicle after it struck the barrier. Most of the barriers kept the car on the road, but caused severe injuries to occupants due to the impact with the barrier. The cable guardrail with the concrete post created a pocketing effect on the post. The half moon sections also produced the same effect pocketing on the concrete posts. Some effort was made to strengthen the rail sections, but it wasn't, uh, but it still produced the same effect, pocketing on the concrete posts. Cable guardrail with wood posts were, was used with some success, but the pocketing still occurred when the guardrail was impacted with the smaller cars. Finally, the current W-beam section was adopted. Since the W-beam sections came in 12 foot 6 and 25 foot lengths, the new standard for guardrail was, was 8 by 8 post at 12 foot 6 inch spacing. And at that time, no blockouts were required. After this rail was in use for a while, NCHRP developed crash test criteria to, to evaluate different barriers. This criteria took into account the strength of the barrier, but also its redirectional characteristics. The G-forces on the vehicle occupants were also included. It was determined that bolting guardrail directly to the post created a tripping or snagging effect as the post laid back uh, when impacted. Thus, the introduction of the blockout. The post spacing remained at 12 foot 6 inches, but the blockouts eliminated the tripping and snagging effect. This design still created some problems. The 12 foot 6 inch post spacing didn't provide enough strength to prevent the rail from laying back when struck and thus allowing the vehicles to ramp over. Additional analysis determined that by reducing the spacing to six foot three inches, the ramping would be prevented and thus we have our current guardrail design. The only modification to this has been the, the reduction of the eight inch by eight inch post to the six by eight inch post. Let's look at some of the elements of a typical W-beam installation. The installation consists of a standard piece of 12 foot 6 inch or 25 foot W beam, a 6 inch by 8 inch or 8 inch by 8 inch by 6 foot long post, a 6 inch by 8 inch by 8 inch blockout, a bolt to hold the guardrail to the post, and a nail to toenail the block to the post. Everything here really is pretty straightforward, except for maybe the reason for toenailing of the blocks. I'm sure most of you felt that the toenailing was done because that's the way the contractor wanted to hold the block up so he got his installation in. But the real reason for the block out is if, if the block outs are allowed to rotate, adequate bearing with a block out will not be obtained and the rail element could rotate when struck. This could allow the vehicle to ramp over the rail as it rotates. One other thing about the blockouts. 
Only two blockouts are permitted on a post. Any more than two will cause the rail to rotate and a vehicle will ramp over the system or snag on the post. Another change that was made in the state of Washington and in some other states has been the removal of the rail washer. It is believed that as the post started to lean back, if the bolt uh, will pull through the rail, it would reduce how much the rail will be pulled down. Having the rail washer, which again is the washer right in here, uh, on other than posts two through eight of a BCT installation, doesn't make the system deficient. So it isn't a requirement that they must be removed to upgrade the system. When installing guardrail, five things are important for a proper installation. They are one, two feet of widening is provided for proper embedment of the post. Two, the guardrail should be lapped in the direction of traffic. Three, the slope into the face of the guardrail is not steeper than 10 to one. Four, the top of the rail should not be more than two foot three inches from the ground. And five, the rail is placed three foot zero inches or more from any rigid object the rail is shielding. Okay, let's, let's talk about some of these items. Lapping a guardrail in the direction of traffic is done so the ends of the guardrail will not cause or will not snag a vehicle as it's sliding down the rail. Uh, the slope into the face of the guardrail is important. If the guardrail is placed on a slope steeper than 10 to 1, a vehicle most, will most likely vault over the rail system. If the rail system is to be placed on a side slope, then it must be placed at least 12 feet from the break point. The standard height for guardrail is two foot three inches above the ground. If the rail is placed higher than this, the vehicle will snag on the post when struck. If there is a need for a rail system higher than two foot three inches, then a rub rail must be provided. Guardrail with a height of less than two foot three inches becomes substandard in height when the distance from the top of the rail to the ground is less than two foot zero inches. New guardrail should always be installed to the two foot three inch height. Guardrail does deflect when impacted. In fact, a standard guardrail installation will deflect from two and a half to three feet. Because of this, it is important that rigid objects be at least three feet behind the rail. Well, sometimes this is not possible. When the rail needs to be within three feet, a transition is required to reduce the deflection. And a good rule of thumb uh, for the length of the transition is that it should be 10 to 12 times the difference of the dynamic deflection between the two systems. The deflection is then reduced by decreasing the post spacing or increasing the post sizes or both within this transition length. Failure to provide this transition could lead to a pocketing on the rigid object. Here's a good example of why the transition is there. Somebody came across there, hit that rail. As they kept getting closer to the end of the bridge, the rail kept, system kept getting stiffer, and, and it kept them from impacting the end of the bridge rail. Because the guardrail deflects, the placement of asphalt curbs in front of it can cause a problem. The curb should be placed as far under the guardrail as possible so that when the guardrail does deflect, the potential for a car to ramp is reduced. If the asphalt curb is placed in front of the guardrail, the vehicle will already be ramped by the time it strikes the guardrail. One thing I haven't talked about up to now is the end treatments. In the past, nobody worried about the ends. It wasn't until we started to get accidents with guardrail going through the vehicle that anybody started to address the problem. At first, no end treatment was provided. People first started trying to devise systems, and what they came up with was a buried cable anchor. And this has proved to be one of the worst things that could be installed. This anchor has the potential for spearing a vehicle, thus causing it to have stopped abruptly, or to roll or to flip. It does provide the anchorage to develop the rail strength, but this is the only good thing I can say about it. What was needed? was an anchor that would develop the rail strength but would also break away if struck end on. Thus came the breakaway cable terminal 
or the BCT. Uh, this design uh, went through uh, several modifications to reach, uh, reach its current design here. Uh, I'd like to point out a few things that are important for a good BCT installation. First, the system was designed to have a 37-foot, 6-inch parabolic curve, and that's what you have right here. The purpose of this parabolic is to give the guardrail a natural bending effect when impacted end on uh, second. Our posts, two through eight, should have the rail washers removed. Uh, the washers will prevent the system from buckling properly, thus it is important that they be removed. Third, the slope into the face of the rail should not be steeper than 10 to 1, and there should be a buildup area so a vehicle will be level when striking the, vehicle, or striking the barrier system. Last, two footings are necessary. The end footings with the cable develop the rail strength, while the footings at the second post make sure that the post will shear or break off when impacted. When this uh, anchor was first introduced, uh, the footings were made of concrete. We now have a steel sleeve, and it's, uh, it's used uh, to make it easier for maintenance to make repairs when struck. Uh, the BCT has been the pr predominant end treatment my notes, I put down eight to 10 years, but I start thinking about it that, God, it's going on more like 12 or 13 years. But a system that should be considered when it is possible to install is the buried terminal. What's good about this system that it makes the ends, or it takes the ends, out of play when struck by a vehicle. I will say that when a buried terminal could be installed, you're gonna get credit for a missed opportunity. And that's a missed opportunity. When encountering guardrail that has been struck, three questions should be asked before making the repair. First, is the guardrail necessary? The hazard that the guardrail was shielding may no longer be there, thus no need for the guardrail. Two, can it be replaced to the current standards? If the guardrail was built to the current standards, this makes the repair easy. If it wasn't built to the current standards, it still may be a simple thing to upgrade it to standard. Okay, and then three. If it cannot be upgraded to standards, to what degree could it be upgraded? Many people have the philosophy that if you cannot replace something to current standards, then you should replace it exactly the way it was. I find this philosophy hard to take. How can you justify replacing in kind a system that has just gone through a car simply because a full parabolic could not be obtained. A little parabolic is better than doing nothing. A breakaway anchor is better than no anchor or the old uh, buried cable anchor. Doing something is better than doing nothing. Just make sure that what is done is the best that can be done and that your decision is documented. In most cases, making these fixes, even though they are not the standard, will reduce the severity of the next accident. Over the years, AASHTO has issued several documents dealing with highway safety of which guardrail plays an integral part. These documents are Highway Design and Operational Practices Related to Highway Safety, dated February 1967. Highway Design and Operational Practices Related to Highway Safety, second edition, dated 1974. Guide for Selecting, Locating, and Designing Traffic Barriers, dated 1977. Recently, this publication, Roadside Design Guide, dated October 1988, was issued uh, to replace the 77 Barrier Guide. And the last two provide some very good guidance on the use of guardrail. Even though this is a presentation on the proper design, installation, and repair of guardrail, Something that I feel goes hand in hand with this is a flattening of slopes to eliminate the need for guardrail. During design, the flattening of slopes should be considered before automatically going to guardrail. If slope flattening uh, appears feasible during construction, it should be done even though it was missed in the design phase. I even challenge maintenance forces to select locations to dump waste material so that eventually a run of guardrail could be eliminated. And I guess it can be stated that a flat slope is less of a hazard than guardrail and one, uh, one less thing for maintenance to maintain.
I'd like to uh, close my presentation by covering a few items that I feel are important in the proper installation of guardrail. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is snow load rail washers and, and, uh, and snow load post washers. Uh, these things are used in areas where there is a large accumulation of snow and the weight of the snow would pull the bolt and the smaller washer you know, right through the wood post. Again, if you have this type of an installation here using the snow load rail washers, no matter what, on post two through eight of a BCT installation, these rail washers on the front must be removed. Another item is when uh, steel posts are used. A steel backup plate is required between the guardrail and the steel blocks on posts between rail splices. This backup plate prevents the rail from tearing on the edge of the steel post or the block out when struck. At times, when making a guardrail repair, long posts will be encountered. These posts uh, were used because the designer was unable to get adequate embedment with a standard post. You know, either the widening, which we have right here, was unobtainable, or the slope out here was steeper than two to one. Uh, it's imperative that these long posts replaced in kind so as not to compromise the integrity of the system. When bolting guardrail to the type F terminal connections at bridge ends, there are some washers that should be installed that are very important to the system. On the approach end of the bridge, the guardrail is lapped over the outside of the type F terminal. The bolts are placed through the slice, splice bolt slot of the guardrail, through the slots of the type F terminal section, and a nut is then attached. And in this case, you can see that the bolt head completely covers up the, uh, the splice holes for the guardrail. On the trailing end, the type F terminal section is lapped over the outside of the guardrail. The bolts are placed through the slot of the type F terminal section and the guardrail in the nut is then attached. In this case, the slots are much larger than the bolt heads and when this barrier system is, is impacted down in this area downstream as tension is put on here, these bolt heads will pull right through that and uh, you'll have failure of the system. To prevent this, washers need to be installed. Earlier, I discussed cable guardrail and showed a couple of examples that were substandard. Now I'm going to present a cable guardrail system that meets standards and it could be considered under certain conditions. It is a three cable system utilizing a weak post design. It can be installed with fill slopes as steep as two to one. Due to its weak post design, it has a deflection of around 12 feet. So the fill slopes must be free of fixed objects. If you have a situation where you have a six to one to 10 to one slope and want to use this, you can place it within that area. The system has some good points and some bad points. The good points are that when struck, it produces the least amount of G-forces on the vehicle occupant. Also, in snow areas, the snow will not drift against it as it would with W-beam. Bad points are that it needs to be continually maintained. The cable needs to be checked for tightness. Uh, also, there's a large deflection of the system. This factor reduces the location where this system uh, can be used. And when struck, more of the system is damaged. Well, it's obvious we have installed this system on one highway and we are considering using it up on I-90 where we've got some old cable barrier up there now and we are looking at using this thing, uh, this barrier to uh, replace that. I'd like to conclude my presentation with this comment. Guardrail is a good tool if it's used right. It's a hazard if it's used wrong. Thank you.